Can you please turn off your cameras too? Because I can see you. And we don't want to see you for a couple of minutes, please. I'm gonna broadcast now. Eh, hola, bienvenidos eh, a todos a este workshop. Eh, mi nombre es Alejandra Cuña, soy coordinadora de agronomía del Centro UC Davis Chile. Es un gusto tenerlos con nosotros y mmm, el título de este workshop es la problemática de Orobanche en Topate Industrial, experiencias eh, de Israel y California. Eh, el, las presentaciones van a ser en inglés y las preguntas y eh, respuestas se van a traducir. Eh, vamos a comenzar con el, el primer speaker de hoy. Su nombre es el doctor Jacob Ogolwasser, que es PhD de la Universidad Hebrea de Jerusalén, eh, Israel, especialista en malezas parásitas con más de 30 años de investigación. Eh, numerosas publicaciones científicas y participación en congresos internacionales. Eh, algunos avisos antes de su presentación. Eh, las presentaciones serán en inglés y quedarán grabadas en el sitio web de UC Davis Chile. Eh, las preguntas, como les mencioné, se van a realizar a través de la sección preguntas y respuestas y se van a realizar después de la presentación de cada de los presentadores. Luego del de doctor Jacob Goldwasser eh, viene la presentación del doctor Brad Hanson. Eh, así que eh, 
So welcome, Jacob. Thank you for uh, for agreeing to present your work with us. And uh, uh, the stage is yours. So go ahead. Thank you very much, Alejandro. And I will share my screen to start seeing the presentation. And I hope we are doing okay. Okay, everybody seeing? Alejandro? Yes, I can see. I can see your presentation, Jacob. Go ahead, okay, thank and you. you. And the volume is okay? Yes, I can well? hear you perfect. Yes. Okay. So, hello everybody, uh, good noon, good morning. For us, it's good evening. And my name is uh, Yaakov Goldwasser. I worked for many years in the uh, Hebrew University of Jerusalem uh, in the plant sciences. I still work there today. And I also work in a other institution, which is the Valley Growers, Valley Farmers Center in Israel, which is in the north of Israel. Uh, I will talk today as part and part of all of my colleagues who actually participated in this research, which are many, and mainly the people from the Agricultural Research Organization, uh, and especially Professor Hanan Eisenberg, which did a lot of the work that I'm going to present today. Uh, so with that, I will start. Okay, today we're talking actually about broom rape. I'll give a very short introduction because I'm trying to summarize actually 30 years of work and I have 20 minutes. That's more than a year and a third per minute. So I'll try to give very short presentation and try to emphasize the important things. So we're talking about parasitic plants. Broom rips are parasitic plants. They're angiosperms, which means they disperse seeds. They grow into roots or stems of other plants. And, and with this growth, they redirect hosts, the nutrients and the nutrients from hosts and water. And what is common to all the uh, uh, parasitic plants is the hostoria, which is the organ that actually is the connection between the parasite and the plant, the host plant. So these are the four main uh, agriculturally important parasitic plants. Here on the left, you see uh, this is Egyptian broom rape, Filipanke egyptiaca, on tomato in Israel. On the right top is daughter, Cuscuta. In this case, it's on uh, spinach in Israel. Uh, on the bottom left, we have tree parasites with, from different families, and they're called generally mistletoes. And this picture is from Davis, California. And on the right on the bottom is Striga, which is a hemiparasite, which means it does have a little bit chlorophyll too. And it's, this is the main problem with parasites in, in Africa. And this was taken in a maize or cornfield in Kenya. Okay. This is one of the basic slides I want to show, and it shows the phases of invasive species invasion and control. And this is an important slide. First of all, today with, with the virus epidemic, uh, they are showing similar curves and talking about the exponential curves, etc. This is very similar with all species that are invasive, if it's plants, if it's animals, if it's birds. So, on the Y uh, axis, we see that the abundance going up and the control costs do too. Here on the uh, X, X uh, axis, so we see that uh, as time passes, the infestation grows. At some place it's recognized. And then where uh, there's a big awareness of it, we're already on the top. And at this stage, it's very hard to control and contain and very costly. 
I would say that in Israel, we are someplace here. And in California, maybe someplace here. And in Chile, maybe someplace here. Okay, what is the Bruma distribution? We're talking about invasive plants. What is their distribution? Well, they're very common and they're not invasive in the Mediterranean because that's where they came from. So the Mediterranean, Middle East, uh, Far East, Southern Europe. Uh, this is the Egyptiaca, which is the broom up we have in Israel, which we call Egyptian broom up. The broom up you have in, Amer in the Americas is mostly, mostly Filipanke Ramosa, and it has more or less the same distribution, but it's also invasive in Australia, in Central and South America. So we're today talking about broom rape, which today is divided into two, uh, two, two, two parts. One is the Orobanke family, and one is the Filipanke family. So if we look at the Egyptian broom rape, and that's the broom rape that's common in Israel, it's branched, it's, it's relatively high, to 50 centimeters height. Its flowers are more purple than white, and the flowers are quite big, 20 to 40 millimeters, relatively big. And if you look closely under a microscope, you will see that the connective anther lobes are hairy. This is what it looks like on tomato in Israel. And the Filipanca ramosa, which is the branch broom rape, or also called hemp broom rape, it's branched, the same as the Filipanca egyptiaca. It's a smaller plant usually. Its flowers are smaller. Uh, its color may be sometimes more pale than the Egyptian broom rape, and the connective between anther lobes are glabrous. This is what it looks like. This is in Cortland, California, Filipanca ramosa on tomato. This is Filipanca ramosa in Slovakia on tobacco. This is Filipanca ramosa in Pinkawe, Chile. Okay, let's go from Chile all the way to Japan. Okay, this is a Japan, Japanese cartoon. I you know that the Japanese like a lot of amine uh, animation. And as I did not know what it says here, they asked for translation. And this is the translation. So this is actually uh, the initial broom rape life cycle stages. At first, the seed is in dormancy. Only after a preconditioning period, it will uh, be able to start uh, germinating. If it does not get this, this induction, it will go back to sleep. But if it continues and gets a germination induction, it will be happy. And if the astorium, which is the organ we talked about, gets an induction, it will succeed to live. Only if it connects to those plant, it will be able to live. If, it, if not, it will die. And this is what it looks like in real life. In real life, this is the seed. This is uh, 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 the connection to the host plant, host root, and this is the, the, the uh, germination. This is already uh, tubercles developing on the roots. And eventually there will be a rooted tubercle, a flower stem, which eventually will grow over ground and flower. What is the broom rape host range? This is very important, or maybe not, because we see that it affects many, many families, many, many, uh, uh, many, many uh, crops from very many, many families. What is interesting here is that, as you can see, it does not attack any of the uh, cereal uh, species. So that's something to remember if you're, if you're uh, considering crop rotation, if you grow cereals, you will not be susceptible to broom rape. Okay, this is processing tomatoes in Israel. It looks like a nice field with nice flowers. And uh, that's what it looks like at the beginning, not at the beginning, before we know how much damage it, could be, it can cause. But this is already a later stage and that doesn't look very good. You hardly see tomato or tomato plants. And in extreme cases, this is the case, 100% tomato yield loss. But if we're talking about tomatoes, we also find it in greenhouses. Though 
usually in greenhouses, the tomatoes are grown in the winter. Talking about Mediterranean climate like we have in Chile and Davis and Israel or California and Israel. So here, even in the winter, we will get bromate. The same for pepper. Pepper is interesting because there are different, uh, different varieties that have different susceptibility, uh, but we're not gonna talk about that today. This is parsley in Israel, and this is cabbage in Israel. So we see they are all susceptible to this parasite, which causes very high <coughs> yield losses. Okay, what we're interested in is controlling this parasite. So what do we do or how do we do this? What are the characteristics that make them hard to control? First of all, most of their life they develop underground, so they're hard to reach. Then these plants are, are very efficient in seed production, dispersal, germination, and longevity. They can grow, they can stay in the soil for at least 30 years in many cases. There is a direct parasite host connections, which makes them selective which makes uh, selective mechanical and chemical control almost impossible. Uh, they're not as susceptible to many of other herbicides. And the parasite becomes visible above ground only after most of the damage has been done. And if we go further into the uh, biology of the plant, we see that one of the reasons they're hard to control is because of the characteristics of the seed. These are very small, small seeds, 50 to 350 micron, which is uh, less than half centi uh, millimeter. They're produced in vast amounts, could be up to 1 million per plant. They mature, even if they're, they're not uh, fully mature, if they're removed from the plant, they mature uh, without the need to, uh, to be connected to the plant. They're, as we said, the seeds can exist a very long time, and they're easily dispersed by wind, water, animals, and actually most of the dispersal is done by human beings. If it's tractors, agricultural equipment, agricultural products, soil, and manure transfer. So this is a capsule of Filipanke uh, Egyptiaca. You see this is one seed. You see thousands of seeds in one capsule and many capsules per plant. Okay, this is just to show you comparison of the uh, seeds, of the, of the size of seeds. You see the Arabidopsis, which is a very small seed, but then you see the Brumip and Striga, which is similar, very small, about 300 to 350 microns. So let's go to the, uh, to the control studies. Uh, what we did in the past, I would say 30 years, as we have been studying this parasite and how to control it. This, these studies have been done in the lab, in the greenhouse, in experimental fields, in commercial field experiments, and also in recent years, commercially applied by the farmers. This is one of our systems to check how the, uh, how the uh, bloom ape seeds germinate and attach to host plants. It's called PEB, polyethylene bag system, which is put in the dark on a glass fiber paper. And here you can see the bloom rape seeds and we follow the parasitism. And what we can see is that here is on the left, we treat it with imazapic. You see it kills the seeds and the tubercles. On the right is the control where uh, they are <coughs> developing normally. And a closer look at a later stage, you can see on the left a dead rooted tubercle on the right, alive. And of course, we do a greenhouse and greenhouse experiments, which we plant tomatoes, and we also plant broom rape. So here, we're counting the broom rape and weighing, weighing the fresh and dry weight after one of the experiments. <clears throat> we also have what we call a minor rhizotron, which is a camera which can be placed under the soil, beneath the soil, and we can see the tomato roots and the attachments uh, live in the soil or in pots. This is already an experiment station. In Israel, we have experiment, uh, agricultural experiment stations which belong to the Ministry of Agriculture. And we did a lot of our work in these stations. And here you can see a system 
uh, uh, <coughs> experiment that we conducted. Here we have the herbicide uh, in this bucket, and this is the electric pump, which pumps it into the drip irrigation system. And here you can see the pipes that uh, the uh, different uh, treatments, according to the treatments, are connected and deliver the herbicide. We did the sampling of water and uh, tested it with LCM SMS, which we can uh, actually uh, follow the parts for billions. And the same we did in the soil and we're sampling in the soil in uh, different depths and different distances from the drip line. <clears throat> this is a commercial field experiment. This is a pre-plant incorporation of uh, sulfa sulfuro. And this is done before, of course, the tomato planting. And this is not the Andes. This is the only mountain in Israel with uh, snow in the winter. Okay, this is commercial field experiments. So even if we go into the whole field, we always leave some control plots to see what we did and how we did so we can have some kind of comparison. This is a, here we can see the broom ape shoots emerging yellow and actually will die. And this is following imazopic applications by the drip irrigation system you see here. <clears throat> okay, this is a, our broom ape experiments in Israel between 2009 and 2016. You can see uh, this is all in Northern Israel. This is the Lebanese border here. This is Haifa. And you can see all the, all the plots we use, uh, over 50 plots in this, uh, in this seven year uh, period. So what are the results? You will see very uh, concentrated results. Uh, first thing we developed a decision support system for blue rate control which is based on the field history, the infestation severity, and mapping. And then we computed a thermal time GDD, growing degree days, starting at tomato planting date. And then we applied prophylactic soil applied chemical treatments by PPI of sulfur sulfur, like we saw with that tractor, or a foliar application, followed by overhead irrigation. And then uh, we apply uh, later uh, imazapic on the through the drip irrigation and at the end also as a, a, a foliage treatment. So the two herbicides, we tested many, many herbicides. The two most important ones that we use is sulfa sulfuron and imazapic. Both are ALS inhibiting herbicides from two different groups. Of course, one is the sulfonyl norea group, the sulfa sulfuron. And the Imazda pick is from the Imadi Zolimon group. And as you see here in Israel, it, both are registered in tomato and both are systemic. Our decision support uh, system is uh, based on uh, infestation severity, as I said. So we're talking about less than one shoot of broom per meter, square meter is, is A, B is one to five and C is over five. So I would say low, medium, and high infestation, according to this. And the thermal time growing degree days is uh, what we call GDD. And actually, it is the average daily temperature minus a T base that is different for each crop. And in the case of tomato, it is 10 degrees centigrade. This is part of the decision system. Uh, according to what we said, the factors we, we talked about before, uh, I won't go into this because this is quite complicated and not complicated, but uh, we don't have time to go into it. And this is the only part of it. This is the second part of it. But uh, in cases where we don't know what the infestation is, we, all, we, all, we apply the herbicide, uh, taking in account the worst case. So this is, a, this is a, one of our uh, treatments, no, some of our treatments, recent treatments in the fields. And uh, actually also in Chile, we followed the same, more or less the same uh, treatments where here we have on the left drips and sprinklers together. The sprinklers are for uh, 
for the, the B treatments, incorporating the sulfa sulfurum, uh, which is monitor, and uh, the cadre uh, treatments are actually all through drip irrigation. I have to say that in Chile, we uh, concentrated on this, on this treatment, on A, A treatments, because they are fully uh, through the drip irrigation. We have pre-planned incorporated, but this is before the tomatoes. And at the end, we have a foliar treatment of Cadre, but here we do not need any sprinklers. So this is some of the sampling I showed you. Uh, you can see the comp concentration of imazapic in the soil for the distance of different dis distances from the dripper, one day after treatment and seven days after treatment. And what is important to you see here that seven days after treatment in the zero to 10 centimeters soil level, we already have zero uh, concentration, which means uh, we need to replenish the treatment. Here. And if we look at, at a similar thing, a similar uh, test we did uh, one day after uh, treatment and 15 days after treatment, we can see that in 15 days after treatment, uh, at all the depths, uh, we have zero, uh, zero PPB of imazapic. And when we tested two regimes, one is a weekly regime, and one is every two weeks, which are two week regimes is more or less, we said we're talking with growing degree base. So this is 200 GDB and weekly regime is about 100 GDB. And here what we can see very uh, clearly is that every two weeks the concentration at the different distances from the dripper, and this is in the zero to 20 centimeter uh, depth uh, level, we can see that every two weeks we have a, a reduction of the, of the herbicide. And in the weekly regime, we have uh, at least two to three times higher concentration, uh, which we can, uh, uh, which stays in the soil. This is a graph of uh, the, these three treatments we just saw. And we see on the top, the control, these are the GDDs. And this is the end of the season here. This is the uh, 400 GDDs of a few, uh, about a month after planting. And here we have the number of inflorescences, bloom rate. So we can see that the control, we have very high infestation. And if we're talking about, it's ex exactly what it looks like the invasive plants grass, graph, sorry. And the bi-weekly, which means every two weeks, we get a great reduction. But when we apply it every week, we get a very high uh, reduction. And this, this, some of these treatments are also the treatments we applied in Chile. Okay, these are results from commercial fields from 2015. And you see the different varieties down here, but what I want you to sh show is the yields, because one of the considerations is that with these herbicides, we are actually also damaging the tomatoes. We're not controlling all the bloom rate underground, but you can see that we have your yields of over 120 tons per hectare. Uh, which mean we can uh, apply these chemicals if we apply them in a smart way, we can kill the parasite and not the host plant. So this is a balance sheet. Of course, it's very rough, but the cost more or less of the additional cost with our system is roto tilling, what we saw, uh, the herbicides themselves, uh, and uh, so the total cost is more, more, more or less $500, but our additional income is $5,000. If we take to account a field that's hit hardly, we will get at least 50 tons per hectare more with our treatments. And so you see the total income uh, in that case. Okay, I would like to conclude that the outcome of this research, this research enables farmers to grow tomatoes on broomate infested fields and ensures increased yields and high profits. I'll buy this success. There remains a need to continue the study of parasitic plant host plant interaction and to, them, to develop a chemical, biological, genetically based and integrated control uh, uh, different 
kinds of uh, different uh, control systems. And this is uh, especially important because we know that the sulfonylurea or the ALS inhibiting herbicides that have been used, these have developed very rapidly a resistance to them. Though we did check this in Israel in recent years and did not find resistance. So we're hoping maybe there it's a little bit different. If we're talking about the national regional brewing control program, I have to stress the, these fundamentals because this is true for United States and Chile. First thing is awareness, then research and knowledge, mapping, sanitation and quarantine, control measures, and very important is good agricultural practices. This means that if you do everything great in the field and you apply the herbicide, et cetera, but the field is not irrigated as needed or not uh, fertilized, so all your efforts will not be uh, enough. So I'd like to show you, this is actually my uh, take home message. Uh, and that's why I'm showing it again. And everybody who's dealing with this parasite in countries where it's invasive, have to remember this slide to take, start taking uh, control measures and applying some of what I, to I talked about in the early stages of parasitism. Okay, gracias por su atención. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Jacob, for your presentation. I really appreciate that you try to summarize your more than 30 years of experience in just 20 minutes. So, muchas gracias. <laughs> so, eh, now we are open for questions. Ahora pueden escribir su pregunta en la sección de preguntas y respuestas. So, we have one. Uh, already Jacob here, so I'm going to try to translate it for you. Okay. Um, uh, have you seen the differences between the application of sulfosulfuron um, when you applied using PPI and um, versus uh, incorporated mechanically, uh, either for with irrigation or um, Spring irrigation or uh, dripping irrigation. So the the main the, the question is differences between uh, uh, herbicide incorporation either by mechanically or irrigation. Have you seen differences in your treatments? Actually, the for for the herbicide to work uh, correctly or uh, in a useful way, we need to uh, pre-plant incorporate it, and then have to or irrigate it or let let the late rains uh, fall on it or in the case of uh, in other cases we tried and we tried also in Chile is to uh, apply the drip irrigation uh, in Israel in, in our initial trials the, the sprinkler irrigation of course uh, is the most efficient because it it takes all the all of the bed falls on the water falls on all the bed and is it more gradually puts the herbicide into the soil or uh, actually activates the herbicide in the soil. Drip irrigation as you know is not very uh, uh, it has it it pushes I saw, also I showed you the mazapik we, we we found in the different distances so actually the concentration in different distances from the dripper will be there will be some kind of gradient and it won't, won't be uh, as that uh, effective theoretically. So let answer? me try to, yeah, let me try to translate your, your answer. Básicamente lo que ellos hacen en Israel es hacer una aplicación al suelo antes de la plantación que se incorpora mecánicamente y luego los tratamientos se hacen inyectados con riego por goteo. Eh, en Israel ha sido más eficaz eh, incorporar el herbicida con eh, riego por aspersión desde arriba. Eh, también un factor importante eh, en la distribución del herbicida, cuando el herbicida es inyectado por riego por goteo, es la distancia entre los goteros y, y el volumen. Eh, 
So we have another question here. The, why the concentration of the herbicide increased with distance from the dripper, although there were some deviations from this pattern? Because the drip irrigation, think of, think of it as a pulses. It pushes slowly. So it pushes the herbicide and concentrates it in the soil. Think of it as, as something that is pushed. It's pushed in this, in this case by water. So it actually concentrates in a certain uh, uh, depth. And below that, of course, they will not reach. And above it, because of the high water, uh, or because of the high water concentration, so the concentration of the herbicide will be less. Okay, so um, yeah, the answer for that question would be that, piense, eh, la, la respuesta a esa pregunta, la pregunta fue por qué la, la concentración del herbicida aumenta con la distancia de, lo, de los goteros. Eh, y Jacob eh, responde de que, eh, pensar que hay que pensar que el, que el sistema de riego empuja al herbicida a, a una cierta eh, profundidad y, y se concentra ahí. Eh, sobre eso se diluye. Entonces hay que pensar que el, el herbicida cuando se inyecta por riego por goteo se empuja hacia el suelo y permanece ahí, bueno, dependiendo de la disipación y características de ese herbicida en particular. So we have another question. Uh, uh, very interesting presentation. I wanted to know if there is previous experience in Israel using tomato pomace, uh, referring to the tomato residue, industrial residue, as a natural resource for the control of these pests. I mean, they meant uh, orvanche, uh, and diseases such as um, uh, and diseases attacking tomato crop because Orobanchi is a weed. So, have you seen the use of tomato pomace? Okay. Long question, short answer. I don't know of any uh, experience with in Israel with the tomato pollens as a control measure. Yeah. Um, la pregunta fue si se, si se, se ha usado en Israel la pomaza, que es el residuo del de la industria del tomate en Israel para controlar enfermedad o maleza y la respuesta de Jacob fue corta y no se ha usado. O sea, no, él no, no se ha usado la pomaza. Eh, do we have more questions? Or, no, we don't have more questions. So, we are going to start with the second presentation. I don't know, Jacob, if you want to make a last Pardon me? <clears throat> no, there's one comment I'd like to make because I don't know if we'll have time at the end, so I'll do it now. I, I want to regret that uh, uh, following the uh, IP agreement, inter uh, uh, intellectual property agreement between UC Davis, Chile, and Sugal, I could not present the uh, three years of experience we did in Chile, which I think are important for this crowd and of course the crowd or the people, or the researchers from UC Davis. I do, I will say mm -hmm. that we did get similar results that we did in Israel, and we concentrated in application through drip irrigation without sprinklers. And that actually attaches okay. to the question we had before. And uh, I just hope that Sugar eventually will understand the importance of presenting and publishing these results. And uh, in the future, we can all enjoy the, uh, these results. Okay. Solo un breve comentario de la investigación que se está haciendo en Chile, eh, mm -hmm. que tenemos algunas reservas por propiedad intelectual y, um, y que en Chile más o menos se está haciendo lo mismo que en, que en Israel en términos de, de control y de, la, de la maleza. Así que ahora comenzamos eh, con... Eh, gracias. Thank you, Jacob. Okay, then uh, so, so now we are going to present uh, Brad Hansen uh, as a specialist in the cooperative extension from UC Davis, California. He has a PhD at the, from the University of Idaho in planning with science. 
Eh, ahora los voy a dejar con Brad Hanson, especialista de la sistema de Cooperative Extension de la Universidad de California, que está trabajando con eh, Orobanche en, en eh, California y nos va a mostrar parte de su trabajo. So, welcome Brad, thank you for, for your presentation. So, go ahead. The stage is yours. Thank you Alejandro for the introduction. Let me see here. Do you see the full screen version, Alejandro? No, Brad. The other one? All right, well, one moment. <laughs> Better? Perfect. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay, very good. Thank you for the introduction and the invitation to um, join this webinar. First, I want to say I'm really honored to share this time with uh, Dr. Goldwasser. Um, learning from his 30 years of experience um, has been, been a, a very beneficial to me um, and also to our, our research team in California. Um, I have about 28 years less experience in broom rape management. So I'd like to just give a little bit of an update on what we are working on um, on branch broom rape research in California processing tomatoes. Uh, before I go too far into this, I want to acknowledge the colleagues, most of whom are on the call. Uh, Dr. Professor Mosin Mezgaran is a, a professor at UC Davis. Jean Miao is a emeritus farm advisor who's worked with the tomato industry in California for, for most of his career. Matthew Fatino is a graduate student at UC Davis working with uh, Professor Mezgaran and myself, and Wally Asipitan is a postdoc who also works at UC Davis. Uh, most of the work that I'm going to mention today has actually been done as part of Matthew and Wally's research here at UC Davis. So just a, a quick uh, primer on the California tomato industry. This is uh, a very important annual crop, a horticultural crop in the Central Valley of California. You can see by the blue dots on that, that map, basically this is an area, um, let's see, approximately 600 kilometers north to south. In 2019, um, we had about 95,000 hectares of tomato, uh, producing a little over 10 million metric tons with a, a value of um, 835 million US dollars. Um, over just comparing last year's um, acreage to over the past 20 years, we're near the low point of a 20 year acreage. Um, we've been somewhere between 93,000 and 100, 133,000 hectares during that time. Yield has ranged in that time from just under 8 million to just over 13 million metric tons. And I would just point out here during that 20 year period, there's been about a 29% decrease in production uh, area planted concurrently with about a 28% yield increase. Um, but over that time period, the uh, value has ranged between about half a billion to just over $1.2 billion US. So this is a very important crop um, sector in California. Uh, Yekov already talked about some of the, the differences among the species here. We have detected both um, uh, Ramosa, the branch broom rape in California, but, and there's also been uh, just two detections that I'm aware of, of Egyptian broom rape, Egyptiaca. In California, these are um, listed as quarantine pests. Um, a listed in California means that it uh, is a um, quarantine and crop destruct pest. Q listed means we don't quite know enough to list it as A listed, but it's a very uh, concerning species. Branch broom rape has been reported on and off for several decades, probably 40 years or so, um, but it, it does seem to be an increasing concern in recent years. And in the past two or three years, there's been several fields that were uh, reported and quarantined and crop destroyed by um, state mandate. Uh, the two Egyptian broom rape uh, detections that I referred to, uh, the first reports were just in 2014 in California of the, of the species. Uh, Solano County is in Northern California near Davis, and both of these sites were fumigated. The crops were destroyed and fumigated uh, to uh, eradicate the seed from the field. 
Yakov already talked about this, so I won't belabor it. I, I agree with his his uh, suggestion that where Israel is probably at the um, top part of this curve, Chile is somewhere partially up this curve. And I think here in California, we're somewhere at the end of the lag phase, or my concern is that we're at the beginning of the exponential growth phase. And so I just uh, concur with, with uh, Professor Goldwasser's assessment. So just a little bit of an update of what we're doing in California, very much building on the work of uh, Goldwasser and Eisenberg and the Israelis who have been doing this work for 25 or 30 years. So I'll, I'll just make a few comments about each of these research areas. Um, the primary one that, that my group is involved in is the herbicide approaches. So basically what we're doing with that work is evaluating the picket, <clears throat> excuse me, the picket system and trying to uh, test and evaluate this under California production systems. In particular, we're working on reg the, the support research to facilitate registration of sulfosulfuron and amazepic in California. Because of the differences in uh, species, branch broom rape versus Egyptian broom rape in Israel, we are um, assuming that we'll have to do some um, fine tuning of the uh, growing degree thermal time modeling to uh, make sure that we're using appropriate application timing for our species in the California environment. Uh, we are evaluating some of the soil disinfestation approaches, primarily um, looking at fumigation, but also some non-fumigant alternatives such as biosolarization and anaerobic soil disinfestation. I'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, as Dr. Goldwasser mentioned, um, the seed, the concern about such a tiny seed and uh, invasive species is the potential spread on equipment and, and you know, human, human facilitated uh, movement of the seed, but particularly harvest and transplanting equipment. And then lastly, um, one aspect of the program that I, I won't talk very much about is the detection and identification, particularly things like um, sensor technologies and um, remote sensing to speed the um, identification of new infestations. So I'll talk just a moment about the, our, our um, delving into the picket system. And this is uh, Matt Fatino is the graduate student I mentioned who is doing this, this work. Our big challenge is here. So the picket system, as Professor Goldwasser mentioned, is based on sulfosulfuron and amazepic. Sulfosulfuron is registered in California as a wheat herbicide, but is not currently registered for tomato. Imazepic is not registered in California at all. It is registered in the United States as cadre, which is a peanut herbicide, and also as plateau, which is a rangeland herbicide, but neither of those products are registered in California. And we have a, a much higher bar for uh, registration of pesticides in the state, so that is not a, a trivial matter. To support registration, a lot of what we've worked on over the last two years, so we, we did our first, Matt did his, um, our first trials in 2019 and in 2020. So one aspect of this is the crop safety data. Uh, to register these products for use in tomato, we need to have, show that we've got adequate crop, sa crop safety. Matt had a total of five field trials, um, primarily focused on crop safety during this period. Another piece of this is the rotational crop impacts because we do have a, a complex rotational system with tomatoes. Tomatoes typically are the most valuable crop in that rotation, but many other annual crops, summer and winter annuals, cereals, as well as seed crops and, and some other, other uh, crops as well rotate. So in 2019, one of Matt's trials was designed um, as a tomato crop in 2019 and planted back to a, a series of important rotational crops during 2020. Uh, obviously the broom rape efficacy data are very important for the growers. Uh, because we're so early in the infestation curve or the invasion curve, we don't have a lot of broom rape sites. So we had our first actual broom rape uh, commercial grower site in 2020. And I believe that trial was actually terminated this morning. So we're just at tomato harvest time here in California. So we, we, these, I'll present a few data from that trial, but it'll be very, very preliminary. And then lastly, um, I think we're looking at uh, 
foreseeing some difficulties in registering a Mazepit in the state. So we may we are also evaluating some of the other imidazolam known herbicides um, that are you know, in that same chemistry, but may have slightly less uh, regulatory, lower regulatory bars to get over. So I mentioned uh, briefly uh, the grower trials. I just got a, a couple of shots here showing the um, rather crude chemical injection equipment um, on the left, injecting the imazepic treatments into a, a, a distribution system in the field so that we can do replicated plot work. On the right, this photo I think Matt took yesterday, um, you can see we have fairly dense inf infestations. They, they don't stack up to the level of infestations in Israel, but this is obviously a, a huge infestation for us in California where this is a quarantine pest. Uh, just to orient you here, the, towards the back of that field is not in the plot area and was, was terminated a few weeks before this photo was taken. In the foreground where it's still green, this was part of Matt's uh, field trial. The different colors of flags here were, uh, we did two or three times a week scouting in that site and the flag colors corresponds to different weeks over about the last two and a half months. This field was about one and a half hectares and I think we found somewhere between two and 3,000 individual plants were flagged out there, uh, clumps of uh, broom rape rather. I'll just make a, a couple of comments here about the level of variability. Um, on the left side of this figure is a heat map, and this isn't the, the numbers aren't super important, but the, the numbers correspond to number of broom rape clusters per 30 meters of row. And on the right side is the treatment numbers. And as I look at the, the heat map on the left, you can see definitely higher and lower areas of broom rape infestation in that field. And I would just point out, um, I'll just draw, pick out one treatment here. Treatment number nine was, um, what should have been probably the most effective treatment out there, 70 grams of sulfur sulfuron and 9.6 grams of imazepic applied five times through the drip. This was our assumed 2X treatment, so it should have been quite e e efficacious. And you can see in, in some parts of the field, we had very you know, great reductions in broom rape uh, clusters, while in other parts of the field, not so much. So these, these data, because of the spatial variability, are gonna be a little bit of a challenge, but just show you some very preliminary data, and I won't belabor the treatments here other than to show this, um, these data show broom rape, cumulative broom rape counts over, over a 10 week period in that commercial tomato field. Um, you can see at least a few of these lines, uh, the green line, the orange line, and the blue line are considerably higher than the others. This was the untreated uh, rim sulfuron and a, a grower standard treatment. So those certainly had more broom rape, although quite variable, as you can see the blue versus the green and orange. The rest of these treatments on the lower part of that figure were the different picket treatments or the different uh, imidazolinone um, alternatives. So because that these are so preliminary, I, I really don't want to get into this too much, but I, I did group a few of these herbicides to, to try to help me help us make some sense of this when I was putting this presentation together. The, the blue line in this figure is the non-picket treatment. So it was, it was the non-treateds, the trifluralin treatments, the rim sulfuron treatments. And again, you can see that curve that mirrors what Yakov showed earlier with the uh, progression over time. In the middle of this range, the picket treatments, this includes all of the sulfosulfuron and imazepic treatments, whether they were 1X or 2X, uh, the intense treatments or the, the less intense treatments, did a very good job in aggregate of reducing broom rape emergence. The sort of yellow orange line on the bottom, this was the foliar imazepic treatments that were put on in about week three and week five of that program. And so I think we, we definitely have some opportunities to use these approaches to reduce broom rape. Uh, certainly not enough to, um, in, a, in a quarantine situation where, um, you know, crop destruction and sequestration is important. But should we get to the uh, a time where management is an option, I think we have some opportunities here. Although I do think we need to do some fine tuning to increase our, our efficacy. Uh, I mentioned this a moment ago, uh, because we are working with uh, 
branched broom rape instead of uh, Egyptian broom rape, which the picket system was based on, we will likely have to make some adjustments to our decision support system parameters in terms of growing degree days. I was also very interested in Professor Goldwasser's comments about the um, one week versus two week um, treatment schedules. And I suspect that that may be something that we want to evaluate as well over time. We are very early in this research process. Oh, I should just also, as I, as I mentioned, we're, we're doing some similar work with rhizotrons and trying to make sure we can understand branch broom rape in the California environment to inform both our, our field research um, as well as the, the more basic research. And uh, Wally Asipitan is leading on this, the postdoc that I mentioned. So just a few photos of Wally's work in the rhizotrons look very similar to what Professor Goldwasser showed a few moments ago. So I don't, I don't actually have any data uh, regarding this, but I just want to make the point that, that we're making our, our uh, fine tuning for our system here in California. A third piece of this is disinfestation of equipment. Uh, because we use commercial transplant services as well as commercial harvest equipment, there's great concern that we're, we're moving seed and plant debris from field to field. And one of Wally uh, Sipitan's projects is looking at a number of uh, quaternary ammonium uh, disinfestation um, treatments to, find, to see if we can actually kill seed in a logistically feasible manner on equipment. So we're uh, still at the petri dish stage of this, but the idea would be to use uh, some of these treatments to clean off equipment either as they enter or um, when they exit uh, known infested fields. So this is uh, very much ongoing. I think these photos were just from a few days ago. Uh, second to last here, uh, we're, we're moving into our soil disinfestation um, aspect of this project. The field site I showed you a few moments ago from the herbicide work, we are actually putting together a protocol for a fumigation um, experiment to go in either this fall or in the spring before tomato planting um, in uh, spring of 20, to, uh, 2021. Our standard quarantine treatment has been a very high rate of methyl bromide, 450 kilo, uh, kilos per hectare or 400 pounds uh, US per acre with a totally, imper totally impermeable film barrier. Methyl bromide has a huge regulatory challenge as, as certainly the Israelis are aware and, and um, all around the world this has been a challenge because of a phase out related to uh, ozone, uh, stratospheric ozone depletion. It also is very expensive around a $10,000 $10, per hectare treatment with the fumigant application and plastic film. We will be testing a number of fumigant alternatives as well as some non-fumigant alternatives in that grower site. Um, this fall or in the spring. That protocol is still under development at, at this point, but um, we should have some good locally focused fumigate, fumigation research to inform our management uh, going forward. Lastly, I'll just touch on the uh, detection and identification. So Professor Mezgaran and some of our other collaborators are working on this in the quarantine facility, and we did take the field um, field site that I showed earlier to, to do sort of a field scale validation because we'd identified thousands of, of plants in a, in a commercial tomato field. So a number of sensor technologies, you know, can we use NDVI uh, different bandwidths to detect this very uh, small statured weed in a commercial field before, you know, while we can still do something about it. So again, we're, we're fairly early in, in the, this aspect of the research as well. So I would say some of our challenges, uh, well, let me start with an opportunity. Um, you know, we're very much building on 30 years of work that's been done with this, uh, with this genus at least in Israel and other places. So we, we don't have to reinvent the wheel, but we are very early in the problem and in the research process in California. Uh, because this is a quarantine pest, we had some regulatory challenges just in moving soil and seed around out of the, from an infested field. We also had very little seed to start with, so, um, so that limited some of our greenhouse research, um, at least at the outset. And because we have relatively few infested locations, our field efficacy research has thus far been only that one site um, in 2020. A, a huge challenge with this is 
because, because it's a quarantine pest in California, I think we have some difficulties in getting reports from the farmers because of the potentially severe economic impacts if they have to destroy that crop. So there's a little bit of a, a perverse lack of incentive to report that crop and which is hampering our research efforts. I mentioned also the cost and regulatory burden of the fumigation. You know, to, to actually do an eradication program for a long lived seed in the soil, fumigation is probably the most effective, but that, that's, not a easy, that's not an easy task, either economically or from a regulatory perspective in California. Registration of the picket herbicides at best will take several years in California because of our regulatory process. And I do anticipate some registration challenges, in particular with a Mazapic. So I expect that we may pivot to using some related chemistry, such as a Mazamox. Um, according to some of our Israeli uh, collaborators, the, the Mazapic has been the most efficacious, but I, I believe they've had some efficacy with other imidazolinones. And so I think we're going to be trying to do a, a parallel track here, pursuing a Mazapic but also uh, pursuing imazomox and others. And then lastly, because this is a quarantine pest, um, these herbicide approaches are really management, not eradication programs. So the herbicides will be very useful if they get registered and if this um, infestation gets further up that in infestation curve that, that we showed earlier but that, that's not going to really work if we're still having to quarantine those fields. So we've got some regulatory challenges as well related to this uh, early stage problem in California. So as I wrap up, I'd just like to say um, compared to Israel and Chile, we are very much at the early stage of branch broom rape infestation. Um, but I do have, I think I and many of our collaborators have concern that this could quickly grow beyond the likelihood where eradication is beyond the point where eradication is feasible. Our area affected and our density of the weed is not high yet, uh, but the economic harm is very high due to the crop destruction because of the quarantine rules. So our research is really building on the building on and locally adapting the work of our, our collaborators in other regions. Um, initially, well, we're working on the soil fumigation um, and soil disinfestation aspects of this equipment sanitation to minimize the spread. Detection, and I should also say education of the growers um, is really important as, uh, because of where we are in, in the uh, disease curve, so to speak. And then lastly, we are spending quite a bit of effort to develop the herbicide tools, uh, sulfosulfuron and imidazolinone herbicides, if this becomes a management uh, expectation. So I'll just close by acknowledging the, the collaborators on this, the California Tomato Research Institute, uh, UC Cooperative Extension, a number of UC Davis researchers, um, uh, Hanan Eisenberg and, and uh, Professor Goldwasser have been very important in advising us uh, as we go forward. And then an array of funding from the tomato industry, uh, the USDA, um, California Department of Food and Agriculture, um, various grant and, and uh, eradication programs. So I will stop there and uh, I, I just want to again thank Professor Goldwasser for the work that his collaborators and he have done over the last uh, several decades and as well as for advising on our projects and I will open it up for questions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Brad. Uh, for your presentation. And um, so we are open for questions. Por favor, las personas que tengan preguntas para Brad, si las pueden colocar en el chat de preguntas y respuestas. So I, uh, I, I do have a question for you, Brad. You mentioned uh, other imidazolinones herbicides. Have you tried the one that you mentioned, imasamox, or yes. an experiment? We, yes, we've had, um, I mentioned five field trials. I think two or three of those had imasamox, imazapir, and imazethapir. 
uh, we were focused on the treatment at that time that was equivalent to the 2x rate of a mazepic. So we've, we've had moderate efficacy with, the, with that imazamox treatment in the grower site. So we, we've had some experience, yes. Okay. So, la pregunta fue si tenían experiencia con otra anida solinona. Eh, y sí, efectivamente, eh, han hecho ensayos con imazamox. Oh, Andrew, uh, could, could I, I would also yeah. add, Imazamox has a, a little bit better fit for our rotation as well. Imazamox is a shorter lived herbicide and would probably be a bit uh, yeah. more beneficial for our rotational crop scheme if we can make it work for broomwave. Yeah, that's a good point. Eh, lo, lo que adiciona sobre Imazamox como ingrediente activo es que tiene una vida media en el suelo menor, entonces hace que la rotación o el carrier del producto sea más, más seguro en, en términos del el, el cultivo que le sigue en la rotación. Um, so, I don't know, I don't, I don't have more questions in the chat. I don't know. Uh, So let me check. Let me double check. Uh, oh, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, we do. Uh, yeah. We do have. Um, I do have um, uh, uh, a question regarding the uh, sanitizing equipment. So have you seen any differences between the uh, product that you tested for sanitizing equipment? The short answer is I, I don't know. We, the, the growers are using quaternary ammonia compounds and in our, in our uh, laboratory work, we've looked at a number of the compounds, um, but we're too early. I don't have any answers to the, any results from those data yet. So the, the growers are using quaternary ammonia, but I think mm -hmm. they, just, they just assume that it works. We don't actually know that it works in the way that they're using it. La pregunta fue si eh, habían observado en California diferencia entre los productos que ocupan para des desinfectar en, en los equipos que van a trabajar al campo, cosechar o preparar el suelo. Eh, Brad dice que no, ha, no, ha, no, no conoce los resultados de diferencia, no ha visto diferencia, pero sí les puedo decir que los agricultores en California están usando amonio cuaternario para desinfectar sus equipos, eh, pero no sabe si hay un efecto real o estadístico de eso. And so, um, uh, there is a question uh, regarding the um, uh, residues of herbicide on the tomato pay paste. So, is there any uh, information or data regarding the residues of the uh, herbicide used in tomato production on the tomato paste, Brad? Yes. Uh, well. <laughs> we're developing those data. So as part of our registration process, we, we, have to, we have to generate those data for the US Environmental Protection Agency to add a crop to the herbicide label. So we have mm -hmm. ongoing research for the sulfosulfuron component. Um, those trials were in the field this year at multiple locations mm -hmm. and we'll, we'll be, the samples will be sent to the lab soon. So okay. we're, we're generating okay. those currently. For, for self or self, you're on. Okay, for self or self. Okay. La pregunta fue um, si existe algún dato de información sobre residuos de herbicida usado en la pasta de tomate. Y Brad um, eh, nos, nos responde de que efectivamente ellos están desarrollando esos estudios para registro um, de ingrediente activo, específicamente sulfosulfurón. Ya esa es la respuesta. Um, uh, Alejandro, could I, add, I could add to that too. I, I believe that sure. similar work was done in Israel when they registered those products. So, so I, I think there's, there's probably very little concern about the use pattern in tomato based on what the Israelis have done, but we have to do that in California as well. Okay, so, okay. Um, Brad um, nos comparte con, con respecto a que podría haber más um, información de parte del, de la experiencia israelita con respecto a los residuos de pasta. Uh, uh, let me ask Jacob if he, he has more information regarding the uh, residues in tomato paste. So Jacob, do you have any 
anything additional to add to the uh, a, any data or studies that they are you, you doing in Israel regarding the um, uh, residues of any kind of herbicide in the tomato paste? No, I, I don't know anything about the, what do you mean tomato paste, the industrial tomato or the paste? Yeah, the, the, the paste, I mean, when you, when no, you well, process I wa tomato. I wanted uh, to add to Brad's uh, uh, information about the quaternary ammonium, that we did the tests in Israel <clears throat> and found that uh, I actually sent Gene, I think, the protocol I used. And in the lab, and uh, not in commercial application, but semi-commercial, on a, a special, uh, it's like a, a simulation of a, of a treatment plant, <clears throat> we found that ammonium bromide is a quaternary ammonium, which is relatively safe. They use it in hospitals, they use it in, for, uh, uh, for bacteria, and different other, other pests. And we found it quite effective on broom ape seeds. The problem is to get it in an even way and uh, uh, straight way into the equipment. That's not very easy. Mm -hmm. So it is a herbicide, not herbicide. It is something that will kill uh, broom ape seeds. But it's, uh, uh, we didn't go to the practical stage with building a, actually a, a real system that works. And this will be also time consuming for the trucks that are coming in and have to be sprayed. And one thing I want to emphasize is a point that is very easy to do. And uh, for some reason in many places uh, is skipped. The best way to get rid of the broom rib seeds is to wash them down. Just take a hose of water with high pressure and wash the equipment down. Of course, collect the seeds on a concrete or some kind of a uh, uh, installation where you can collect the seeds. If they stand in the water for two or three weeks, they will die or different ways to somehow collect them. But the most efficient thing to do, which you can do also in the field, is uh, of course you can use compressed air if you have, or uh, just water, just wash them down with water. So mm -hmm. that's even before going and all to these tests, which in Israel, by the way, uh, they do not use. They do not uh, uh, do any disinfestation of the uh, of the equipment. Yeah. But that's maybe Let because me... we have so much broom rate that uh, it's already not not a, a, a good way to make sure that you won't have broom rate because we have it. So let me let me translate, Jacob. Okay. Um, so uh, according to the last. Eh, de acuerdo a la última información que, que presentó Jacob, eh, la forma más, mm, más segura es lavar los equipos con agua, con agua pura, lavar los equipos eh, y, y tratar de colectar esa semilla en una superficie sólida, concreto o algo. Eso es como lo, lo más simple de hacer. Con respecto, a, con respecto al uso de amonio cuaternario, eh, el mayor desafío es eh, la aplicación uniforme al equipo y que sí estaría presentando algún efecto, pero él hace énfasis en que agua, agua pura eh, es suficiente para remover físicamente la semilla, que es lo más importante, y ojalá colectarla en, un, en una superficie eh, sólida. So you you mentioned uh, ammonium quaternar uh, ammonium, right, um, right. Jacob? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. So the, eh, ellos han visto efecto, pero el mayor desafío es tratar de aplicarlo uniformemente al, al, al equipo que se que ha tenido contacto con, con plantas de de orobanche. La semilla, los que han trabajado con con semillas de orobanche saben que es bien pequeña eh, y es difícil de De, de observar. Um, do, let me check if we have more questions on the. Uh, yeah, we, we, we have another question regarding the uh, differences between uh, tested products on a uh, washing machine. But I already, I already answered that uh, ammonium quaternarium is one of the of the um, of the options. But you can you can do the machine washing using uh, plain water. 
No, we don't have more questions. So I don't know if you you want to add a closing remark. Yes, I, I, do you I hear wouldn't... me? Uh, do you hear me, Alejandra? Yes, I can. I can hear you. I, I have one uh, remark, uh, not remark, but actually a suggestion. Uh, we, we heard and we know what's happening in, in California, and we didn't hear much, but we know what's happening in Chile. And my suggestion for already a few years is some way to set up a collaboration between UC Davis Chile and UC Davis California. That's the most natural thing that could be. You even have almost the same name. And you have the same, same email addresses too, by the way. So uh, what I suggest is somehow to have a cooperation between these two organizations. And I know that's one of the missions of UC Davis Chile. And this could be also together with student exchange. There have been many Chilean, Chilean students in UC Davis, I know. So it would be very, I think, uh, appropriate to have one or two students exchange from Chile to Davis to work on these, uh, exactly what we're talking about, uh, all these experiments, because I think uh, the situation in Chile or the, the, uh, the experimental, uh, uh, the, what we call the, the DSS, the, the uh, decision support system and the GDD, et cetera, is very, very similar, I don't think, I know. It's very, very similar in California and, and in uh, Chile. And I think a lot of the information you already have in Chile is some of the questions that Brad asked. So if Chile can give UC Davis the information and work together with them, that would, be, I think, bring you uh, one step at least uh, further to solving the problem. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jacob. Solo Jacob nos invita a colaborar más entre eh, UC Davis California y UC Davis Chile, que es lo que estamos haciendo ahora con, con este seminario, y um, enfocarnos en el Decision Support System y en, eh, en el sistema de diagramas. Okay. Um, con eso, um, si no hay más preguntas, eh, damos por finalizado. Um, este eh, workshop sobre, sobre Orobanche, el desafío de Orobanche, experiencias en California y en Israel, y los vamos a estar invitando a futuros eh, workshops que vamos a estar eh, organizando eh, para, para la industria. Gracias.